Out in the foyer there, last week we uh, talked a little bit about Compassion International. And you'll see on the table, there's still some uh, pamphlets with, with uh, cute little faces on there. And uh, those cute little faces, they need your compassion. They need your... <laughs> They need your support and your love. And um, we do ask that if you pick one of those up, that you would uh, let the office know, okay? Because uh, the office is uh, keeping track of those pamphlets. And we want to make sure that if you take one, that you're properly uh, signed up and connected with that, with that individual. And so uh, please be aware of that. At the end of the service today, there will be uh, uh, baptisms, and it's a it's a wonderful uh, moment to share as a family. Baptisms, um, and you can see our, our our little pool is set up here, and so. Um, that will be a, an encouraging and exciting time to just share in the, uh, the joy of new believers, people who are stepping out and, and professing their faith, in, faith in, in baptism. Paul, I think that covers it all. I'll uh, turn it over to you, but I'd just like to say to everyone, it's, it's good to see you here, and I'm glad you're here to participate with us. Thank you, Eric, and uh, and I too add my welcome to you and uh, so many friends that are here as well. Uh, a great many who have come to be here for Betty Richter's birthday. <laughs> and because they were here, they could take in the wedding too. <laughs> Happy birthday, Betty. And uh, we are uh, also able to uh, rejoice. And if you don't have a good place, we have some right up here in first class. So you can uh, come up and join some of the good folks that are here and be able to see. I know the premium seats in the back, those fill up quickly. And, uh, and Lord willing, the time will come when phase three will have additional seating in a balcony in this room. And we're trusting the Lord for that and praying and he's uh, we've built what we've done in the adding to the building by faith and he's provided the uh, the elevator is the next and that is order is in and is in the process of being prepared we look forward to having that for us um, one thing Eric didn't say is that his daughter, Liz's daughter Katie, has been in Greece and a uh, short-term mission trip, spent the night last night in Chicago, scheduled to be back here in uh, Sitka and back home and with us here in a, tonight, 8 o'clock. And so uh, uh, we'll be hearing from her if we can somehow get her up here, but that may or may not happen. <laughs> Good to have, I know Larry and Stephanie are glad to have their daughter and grandson with them, uh, but uh, we want to be remembering Stephanie in prayer. She's in the Welcome Center as you came in, but uh, she has an injury on her leg from a fall that is uh, has some complications, and two in a couple weeks is scheduled for a surgery on her sinus, and uh, so there's some special needs that are going on there, and we want to remember her. Please remember, too, the bronze and and those that are in camp when do they get back brent uh, uh, i think thursday August thursday and so they've been serving there but we have had a lot of our young people in camps both in juno and uh, down south and so that's been a great uh, ministry as well our mission's focus for this week is uh is Catherine Watson. She was here just a month or so ago and she's back now in Turkey. She's done a move to Ankara, Ankara, however you say it. And uh, God is working out things for there and giving her contacts in that Islamic country. And so one other thing I'd like for you to notice that we uh, had the Nuccios and, uh, and they were our missionaries in Kenya and Mombasa. And while they 
they were back on on this short trip, they were trusting God for ten thousand dollars to uh, to purchase this building in Mombasa, uh, for which they would uh, have ministries uh, located there. They were <laughs> thinking of how to raise the funds, the ten thousand. They had a little uh, formula of how one woman could get ten other women, and they could all give a hundred dollars. Well, we they only had fifteen hundred, and we gave them ninety five hundred while they were here. God stirred your hearts, and I uh, rejoiced in your generosity, and they rejoiced, and, and uh, sent me these uh, pictures to say, well, they've got the building, and this is what's happening inside as they begin the renovation, and it looks like a big mess in there, but uh, this is what God is, uh, is allowing to do, but there's also uh, uh, some folks in our church preparing to make a trip there in November, and we're praying for God to prompt the right ones to travel to Mombasa, Kenya, and uh, so if you are interested in doing that, uh, you could talk to Celeste Tidenko. She was in our service last night. This morning she's in the toddler nursery. Or uh, just let us know and we'll put you in touch with the people as this uh, plan is being made. So uh, let's uh, go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time together today. And may all that we say and do point people to you. I thank you for that which we see in Matthew 14. And may it speak to our hearts. We do remember Stephanie Jester. Pray for your healing work and your protection, your strength, both in the, that which needs to heal in her leg and for the procedure to correct a problem in her sinus. We do pray for these things in the medical people people that will be assessing may that which is necessary be done. We do continue to pray for those that are in camps and uh, for Chris and Natalie. We ask that you would uh, help those uh, experiences that young people have had where they've considered their, their life in light of your call and responded to that and may they follow through now on commitments and decisions being made. Give strength, extra patience, insight, good health to those who are working with them in the camps as well. We thank you for Catherine and her willingness to go and leave her, her place here in southeast Alaska to be in Ankara, Turkey and working among women there. Give her those relationships and connections there as she's recently made this move. Watch over Katie too as she does the final leg and may this be a time of real growth and development in her and may that which the group did in, in uh, in Greece, bear fruit in the work of your kingdom there. And Lord, as we as a church seek to do your will here in pointing people to Christ, I pray that we might be able to see all the needs being met, including the financial needs for that which we are doing, expanding our building. We know that you are faithful, you are powerful, you have the ability in all things, and we can trust you in that. And so I pray for the enablement of your spirit in bringing this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that weren't here last week, we were considering the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. All the classes are synchronized with, in the various things with the same text that we consider here. I went into my office after the service and there was a little bag from one of the classes that had a couple little buns of uh, bread and a bag with, with some little gummy fish. And so uh, I even had something to eat afterwards as well. <laughs> All were fed, and I talked about the sufficiency of Christ. Well, Christ is the perfect teacher, and this, often the Sea of Galilee in that northern area, the surrounding hills, was his classroom. And as we come to this passage this morning, to put it in context, it's nearing the end of his second year of ministry. His ministry lasted about three and a half years. So he's well into his time of preaching and teaching and presenting himself. And we know that as the background for last week's miracle in Matthew 14, there had been a need for them to pull back and rest. He had just received the news of the death 
of John the Baptist, his close friend and relative, the one whose life was devoted to him. He had sent the disciples out on a, on a mission trip, so to speak, a, a little bit of field experience for them, and they had returned, and they needed to talk, to debrief is the term that is used. Also, they had been so involved, so many people had been coming, the scripture says they didn't even have time to eat. They needed to have that time. However, when they went to that secluded place, people followed them. Christ saw that crowd and had compassion on them as sheep without a shepherd, taught them and fed them. After dinner, they were ready to make him king. And in John 6, 15, one of the four accounts of this miracle, it may have been that even the disciples concurred with that. This is a good time to bring this all to a head and establish Christ as the king as who he is. Well, shrewd politicians know well that a promise of a free lunch is a good way to win votes. But even though Jesus could have delivered on a promise like that, this is not the way that the kingdom would come. And so just at the conclusion of that event, we begin with our passage, the very next verse from where we left off, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And so, beginning there to read, immediately, he says, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick, and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Now, not in the passage that we read, but in the Mark 6 version of this account, there is one other ingredient that is very important to know. Because there we read that he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And you look at that, and it's puzzling. How could those who had followed him two years, who had listened to him teach daily, who had participated with him in multiple miracles and had just finished having one of his great miracles take place in their own hands, how could they have a hard heart? Well, what is a hard heart? When we think of a hard heart, we think of one who rejects Christ and hates him, ignores him, refuses to humble themselves before him and believes. But now we see that Jesus' own followers, in one way or another, had a heart that had been hardened. And so Jesus produced, and if you're Calvinistic, you could say he produced this. If you're not, you could say he allowed it. So whether he produced it, allowed, a storm came. He allowed a situation with applications. We could call them lessons to soften their hearts and strengthen their faith by exposing their weakness while he revealed himself himself and his abilities. And so let's look at the lessons here that come from this story that we just read. For we see here that there's lessons on faith and the will of God. We'll also see lessons on perseverance and focus and the purpose of faith. But first we see very, at the very beginning a lesson on revelation that the Lord speaks to reveal his will. Immediately he said, he made the, it says he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him 
the other side. They didn't have to wonder what the will of God was. Jesus made it very clear. He told them, this is what you are to do. Now, it's not that long of a trip that they had in mind. They had been in the northeastern part of the Sea of Galilee in that area, there along the, the base of the Golan Heights. That's not a great body of water. North to south is about 8 miles, or 13 miles. Uh, left to right, the widest is about 8 miles. And so uh, it tells us that uh, they landed, as we read, in the area of Gennesaret, which is right over here. They set out for Capernaum, so they didn't. Somewhere along the beach over there is where they ended up. They had started out from the slopes over on the other side there at the base of the Golan Heights. And Jesus is up on the hill there praying while his disciples at the end of the day had set out to go over across to the other side. There was no conference to formulate this plan. Jesus was in charge. And as we see the story unfolding from here, we would expect that when Jesus is in charge and you're doing what he told you to do, that there should be not only figuratively but literally smooth sailing. That uh, we expect that when we're in the will of God, things go well. Storms are for people like Jonah, who when God says do this, go the other direction. But all of these subsequent events took place while the disciples were in the path of obedience, doing what the Lord said. Notice how he speaks with authority. And uh, here we see that the Lord expects you to obey when he speaks. He made the disciples get into the boat, forcefully saying, get in the boat and go out, and I'll take care of dismissing this crowd. Now that's not the Jesus that you see in the art of uh, the Renaissance, uh, an effeminate Jesus gliding around with a halo on his head looking sad, pale, sickly, and weak. This is a take charge Jesus who speaks with strength and authority, assertive and decisive. Now, for some years, in the early years of my ministry, when I met with couples prior to a wedding, I gave the couples a, a written questionnaire. And there was one of those questions on this questionnaire. I didn't do this on the, I don't do this one anymore. So I won't be telling you what John and Maddie said. But I asked, what do you appreciate about your parents? And the frequent response from those who were just leaving adolescence into adulthood often came out something like this. My parents were there when I needed them. Now there's various ways to uh, understand what they're saying. You know, I really could count on my parents. But also I heard a little bit different tone in that. They were there when I needed them. And when I didn't need them, I didn't want them there. In other words, mom and dad, stay back. Leave me alone to have my way until my foolishness catches up with me and then come and bail me out. I'll let you know when I need you. And that is often the way people relate to the Lord. I'll do everything on my own, my way. But then when I need you, Lord, come help me. Save me. The Lord expects us to obey at all times, not just at these special crisis times. And so we see a lesson here on faith and perseverance because we see the testing that happens. And this tells us that you will experience trouble even after you obey the Lord. He's dismissed the crowds. He's up on the mountain praying. What is he praying about? We can speculate. It doesn't tell us that uh, there was some particular agenda and purpose and focus of his prayer. It probably had to do with what had happened that day, what was taking place that night. And from where he was before him out there in the dark were his disciples, his ones that he had called and prayer, prayed. His investment was in them. They would be the ones to carry on his ministry when he had completed his and had ascended. He had never explained his lesson plan for the curriculum that he had for them that night. 
He could have. He could have said, I'm going to have you guys go out in the boat. You're going to have a bunch of, of storm tonight, but don't worry about it. I've got it all under control. He didn't tell them that. He just said, go across. And the Lord doesn't confer with you and I as to the type of testing we would prefer. We don't have a menu to go through and say, yeah, I think I could handle this test. Not that one. Maybe later. He's not our co-pilot. He doesn't give us the right of consultation to approve and disapprove of what he's going to bring into our life. And re remember that, and it's no less love on his part for us that he doesn't tell us ahead of time what we're moving into, even in obedience. But there's something about patience there as well. That your struggle that you will go through will last longer than you would prefer. That's almost a duh. When we think about uh, something unpleasant, the minute we have pain, we want relief. But it says, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. And that's, that's an important thing. That identifies a time in the night. The Jews by this time had adopted the Roman system of keeping track of the various shifts that a watchman would, uh, would take to look out while people were sleeping. And so they started out, the swing shift would start at 6 p.m. And that first watch was from 6 to 9, and the second watch was 9 to 12. And the swing shift went off and graveyard switch began and that was the third watch, 12 to 3. The fourth watch was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. When did he come? They've been out there in this storm. He comes in the fourth watch. He could have jumped in at the first gust and large breaker that they experienced, but he didn't. He saw their trouble from the mountain all through the darkness of the night. His heart was with them, yet he didn't go to their relief until his time had come. And so maybe after nine hours of struggling out there to go a short distance into the wind, doing what the Lord had told them to do, then Jesus comes. They, like us, in a storm might say, Lord, why did you wait so long? You could have come and brought your relief so much sooner, but you didn't. Which causes us to think, because obviously there's more of an application than just wind blowing and waves, although we can experience that quite literally here. But when we're talking about the storms of life, I sat down one time a few years back and, and just started making a list of those things that, that would be typical of a storm as we know what happened there in the boat. Well, a storm is when unpleasant stress is brought to your immediate attention. You won't have gone through a storm and said, oh, I didn't even realize I was having a storm. You will notice when the storm starts, rest assured, it won't happen unaware. When your routine and your original course are violently disrupted, when factors that were once harmless while that sea was placid and calm, harmless, peaceful, friendly, turn powerfully against you. And we can experience that type of factor when our body that once worked so well isn't working so well. A child that was once cute and cuddly and lovable is not that anymore, or a loved one. It can happen in our family, it can happen in our job. I have five sisters, and my oldest right now, it's happening in her mind. Janet was one of the brilliant ones of our family who didn't need to have a, a cash register when she brought her items to the counter. As they were read off. She was totaling them and could give you the total, and now she has what's called Lewy Body's disease, which includes de delusions and hallucinations, tremors like Parkinson's, and it's going to be fatal. We got together, the six of us, in May for what will likely be her her last birthday and our last time together. When adversities join forces and come in combinations, it wasn't just one thing. It was the wind and the waves. And so we sometimes say, oh man, one was bad enough, two things going on. It's when you feel powerless 
and afraid. A storm is when you think back and wish you had done differently. That's when the if-onlys start. And if only I'd done this rather than that. When you feel that something must happen immediately or it will be too late. When stability and shelter is beyond your reach. When you feel that you're to be pitied. When you do not know and cannot control any longer where you are going. You're being carried along by this storm and life is out of control, going the wrong way and seems to be only getting worse. When you feel helpless, hopeless, and it's useless any longer to try. Your earlier preparations are now being tested to the limits. And maybe worst of all, God seems distant, far away, and possibly angry. Have you ever had such an experience in your life? This type of a storm may start suddenly. It could start with what was a routine checkup at the doctor's office. When the phone rings at night later than when friends call to visit. A brief, impersonal statement from your supervisor at work. A knock at the door and a person standing there in a uniform. It may be that your storm came on gradually as something valuable steadily began to slip away or as something painful progressively increases in intensity. The disciples were in a storm and we can rest assured that God in his providence for us leads us through storms as well. But we see the lesson here on faith and focus. For we have a new perspective when Jesus is in the equation. What threatens you is no problem to the Lord. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, it says they were terrified and said it is a ghost and they cried out in fear. Now he could have just appeared in the boat with them as he appeared to his disciples after the resurrection on that evening. He could have come rowing in another boat and shown them how he could do it better. But he came walking on the water. And I think that's significant. Some years back, Carolyn and I were privileged to be able to attend a Billy Graham School of Evangelism in Alberta. So we flew into Calgary and our first time there and we had to take a taxi from the airport. Several times we took a taxi and it seemed that almost all the taxi drivers in Calgary were from the Middle East and uh, they handled us very well. No matter what we asked, we'd hear the same answer. They didn't say it quite like we would say. They sounded like this, no problem, no problem. In fact, after hearing no problem uh, so many times, we began saying that same way, trying to imitate the accent to each other, no problem. <laughs> the very thing that threatens us is no problem to the Lord. The stormy water threatened to destroy them and he comes walking on it. It was no problem to him. And so we see a lesson here on courage, how it is that the presence of Christ answers fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. He wasn't just saying to them, don't worry guys, it's just me. This banner up here about the Old Testament name for God, the most holy of his names, Yahweh, the one they wouldn't speak, is that which expressed his eternal self-existence. He is the I am, not the I was, will be, the I am, the eternal one. And this is the expression that he's using, that which was used in the Old Testament to designate Jehovah. We find it in Exodus 3.14. When Jesus made a claim to this in John 8.58 to be this I am, the Pharisees tried to stone him for blaspheming. He's saying, it's I am who is here. Not merely just me. The one who is coming to you is the Almighty One who made the wind and the waves, who rules over them, and to whom they obey. Now here we have this little inserted uh, thing that only Matthew re records is, is Peter's little episode. And there's various ways to interpret what took place there as far as whether that was a good idea or not. But Peter, in his uh, personality and way, says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. I don't, I'm not so sure that this was a good idea. 
but may have more represented some uh, motive on his own part that could have be, come under the heading of vainglory. True faith never attempts wonders merely for the sake of doing them. Amazing stunts to impress your friends. It's the impulsiveness of Peter. But giving credit where credit is due, he had that unique experience of walking on water. And one thing about being a Peter-type personality, the world's advice often is, okay, be religious, be a Christian, but keep things in balance. Don't go overboard with this religion thing. Well, once, not just once, but twice. Again in John 21, when the, Peter was with his disciples, Peter, or Peter was with the other disciples after the resurrection, and they were there back at the Sea of Galilee, they recognized that's Jesus on the shore. They're 100 yards offshore. And what does Peter do? Splash. He's in the water again. He could swim because he swam the 100 yards, leaving the rest of the crew to bring the, hundred, uh, the net full of fish that are <laughs> still in, their, in the boat. He went overboard. But then comes the doubt. The focus of your attention will determine your direction in life. Jesus invited Peter to come in order to teach him a lesson. And Peter, who by profession was a fisherman, stepped out and walked to Jesus. But then it says when he saw the wind whirling, the water around him, that's when he became afraid and sank. His trust in the power of Christ gave way to his dread of the wind and the waves. And it's a dramatic moment when he says, Lord, save me urgently. Do it quickly, according to the tense. And the Lord said, Peter, why did you doubt? It's a word that is used only here, and we're going to read the other usage at the end, just before the baptisms, when we read that they all came together and worshiped the Lord, it says, but some doubted. It's being pulled two different directions. It's when he saw the wind and the waves. There's something important about what Peter was seeing. First seeing the Lord and then, then seeing the weather. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, after leaving Egypt, they were at the mountain there. It says, now when all the people saw this display of the glory of God and power, thunder and lightning around the mountain there, and the sound of trumpets and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. But in contrast to their fear, based on what they saw, we have in Acts 7, Stephen, one of the original seven of the deacons there, as he is preached boldly and is about to be stoned to death for his message it says being full of the spirit looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God not seeing what was a sermon that has gone badly not because he didn't speak the truth but because of their response those who looked at him saw his face as the appearance of an angel that's why we have this conclusion in Hebrews that says we are to run the, the race now with patience. We are to run based on the fact that there's a whole group of cloud of witnesses of, of our faith. And we're looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sealed at the right hand of the throne of God. If you're looking for a good little phrase to express the Christian life, looking unto Jesus is very profound. Looking unto Jesus. It was Haddon Robinson who has written a text that is used in many seminaries and schools across the country for preaching. A great preacher. He went to be with the Lord a week ago. But he said, in any given situation, what you are determines what you see. And what you see determines what you do. Peter was seeing the Lord and then seeing the wind and the waves. What are you seeing? And that's why I say the focus of your attention determines the direction of your life. 
And so we see, in conclusion, lessons here on the purpose of faith. As to salvation, only Christ can deliver you from destruction. And so when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Peter, Jesus in the boat. It dies down like that which has labored and is tired. It's exhausted itself, and the disciples are safe. The Lord is there with them. And so there we see what he, I think, was wanting to see happen. We see the worship here. And this is the ultimate goal in building faith, is that we want people to have knowledge of the Lord. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This wasn't the first time they saw his authority over, over a storm. In Mark chapter 4, he had stilled the wind and the waves, and they said, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? Now the second time he's done it, and they say, Truly he is the Son of God. And then... They arrive at the, at the shore, and we can just say when Jesus, are, when Jesus is recognized, when he's the center of attention and he's the focus, people are drawn to him. We don't need gimmicks and door prizes and entertainment in order to draw people. Jesus will be attraction enough. But it ought to lead us to this question. Do you have a hardened heart? For we see that this was the issue for his disciples. Not seeing Christ as he is. And so a hard heart as found in the disciples and in us as well is to be uh, failing to be in step with Christ in the pursuit of his purpose, not ours. Now his disciples had this condition of heart, this problem, and so we can say, even though you are forsaking the allurements and attractions of the world, for that's what they had done, they had left those things to follow Jesus. Even while you are totally involved in religious work, for that's what they were doing, even while you are spending time in the presence of the Lord. But if in your heart you're beginning to look for something other than what the Lord's purpose is, and in their case it had to do with the miracle, the expectation of immediate gratification, preoccupation with political and material goals. It doesn't matter whether you're right or left wing. If, if that's what you're looking to for a solution, it's an indication of a hardness of heart that is not like Christ. Viewing God's work in terms of what can he do for me in this and not what is he disclosing of himself. Now that's why we read in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Without faith it's impossible to please him. And so Karen Maines, the author of the book Open Heart, Open Home, made this reflection that I jotted down one time. Am I settling for the words, forms, and activities of the Christian life but avoiding the agonizing process of true and total discipleship? Somehow that resonated with me and I held on to that. An agonizing process sounds like a storm. And so I have to reflect on this. Is my heart hardened to God's purpose to reveal Jesus to me and then to the world through me? Oswald Chambers put it this way, beware of worshiping Jesus as the Son of God and professing your faith in Him as the Savior of the world while you blaspheme Him by the complete evidence in your daily life that He is powerless to do anything in and through you. It's a contradiction, you see, to say, here's who Jesus is, but then to live as if He has no power and ability to do anything in you. Hebrews 3 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. He's writing this to believers, leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called a day, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So, we talked about what a storm could be, but now I'm going to ask more specifically, what is your storm? What is God setting in your life, teaching you to trust Christ? Something where he might be saying to you at a certain point, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
1997, I was privileged to be able to go to Israel, and I was there at the Sea of Galilee, and, and the tour group that I was with, I didn't know any of them. Lord willing, someday it might be us, and it'll be different then. But we went out on this boat on the Sea of Galilee, and what a profound experience to be out there, to be on the same waters that these stories that I've heard all my life, to look at the hills and think, those were the hills that Jesus was on. That may have been where the pigs ran down. This may have been where he was praying or his teaching. Now, I was out there and took these pictures, not with a very good camera, and, uh, and just thinking, what a time. I just wanted to meditate. But then one of the a deckhand brought some bread up from the kitchen, put on the table, and people started feeding the birds. <laughs> And the birds were all over, and, and they got into it so much that they ran out of bread, and he went back a couple more times and kept bringing bread, and, and they were just having a great old time feeding the birds. And I don't want to sound super spiritual, but in my mind I was saying, Really? <laughs> all this way to be in this setting to just spend our time feeding birds i could have fed birds back at home but i realized that in the greater context of what the lord is wanting to do and who he is people go through life feeding birds not really seeing the bigger picture at all but you know what would have changed the atmosphere very quickly in our boat that late evening? A really good rip snorter of a storm. Because then we'd have forgotten all about the birds. And they'd have been gone. And we'd have had to deal with more serious issues. That's why storms are useful in our life. So if you're going through a storm or if entering into one, coming out of one, don't despair. Trust Jesus. Your wild storm is just the ground that he walks on. To you, it's life-threatening. To him, he's the Son of God, and he says, no problem. Father, we thank you that we can trust such a Savior, that he is with us in life and we can walk with him and know that he is in charge, that he will bring that which is best. But may our hearts be sensitive. May our focus be on Jesus Christ, his purposes. May we learn these lessons as we see them in your word and then apply them in the everyday experiences of life. Speak to our hearts, each one now, according to the application that your spirit would, would make. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing, and then uh, we'll have the baptism. Because we want to have those that are in the nursery be able to uh, be here for the baptisms, if at all possible, if you have a child in the infant or toddler nursery, this would be a time that you could go as we sing and uh, retrieve your child, and then that will allow them to be in here for this very special time as well. So we'll sing one song. Let's stand together, and those that are going to be baptized can come to this.